Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside Mr. Martin Popoff. What's up, Martin? Morning, sir. Morning, sir. I'm just trying to adjust our audio a little. You're coming in a little bassy. Here we go. We'll turn you down a bit. A little there bassy. Wow, <laughs> I can't say I've been called bassy often in my yeah. life, but hey, you know, the power of oh. audio equipment and microphones and this yeah. crazy voice I have. I tell you, I, I've got one of these these situations where the volume knob on my on my computer volume is is, you know, it's probably got dust in it or whatever. And it's super, super sensitive. So you turn it up and it turns it down on itself. And oh, and, it, and it's like really, really, you know, you constantly have to adjust it. So. Anyways, here you're, you're see, sounding I don't, I don't, great. I don't have those kind of knobs. I have like buttons. You put, oh yeah, yeah. Because you, know, you know the Macs are different, right? So Macs have like the the yeah. the, the volume up button and the volume down button. So I, I remember the old PC days where you had all these switches and knobs and yeah, things like yeah. that. So <clears throat> so today we've got uh, we got an interesting show that quite frankly I'm amazed that we've never done before here on the Fun House. I think we've done something similar on in the prog seat at one point a while ago, I think, but I didn't look. I kind of we, we tend to when we talk about I mean today's episode we're going to be talking about our five favorite rhythm sections. We tend to when we do these type of shows we'll do our favorite drummers and we'll do our favorite bass players or guitar players or keyboard players or singers that sort of thing but uh and i'm doing like this whole month i'm doing guitar teams but i you know rhythm sections for whatever reason is something we never really tackled before and it's actually kind of like a, a no-brainer and so you know when I, I believe i got this uh, particular idea from uh stuff from viewers so, so i threw a whole bunch of topics at martin and martin's like yeah, i like that one i think we can do something pretty interesting there so uh that's what we're gonna do today so uh, i'm gonna have martin kick us off again we're gonna talk about the, the the team obviously the bass player and the drummer why we pick them why they're our favorites and what makes them unique and i'm sure we're both going to come up with uh totally different reasons for why rhythm sections work for us like you know like you know we all hear things differently so we all look for different things out of a, a bass and drum team uh and we'll, we'll go over why with our picks so i'll kick it over to martin yeah exactly when i saw this idea i thought well we must have talked about this before and then i had my usual negative thought of uh oh i don't want to talk about the same same bands i've talked about too many times or or um you know and then thinking oh well, well we probably have done drummers and bass players stuff but then i got to thinking about it and i thought in that word section is kind of a neat thing where where you know this really is about the combination of the bass player and the drummer and uh, and i started seeing certain trends of what the guitarist is like in those bands and how he relates to these guys so uh i'll, I'll bring up a little bit more of that as we go along but in the in the time-honored tradition of these um I'm going to start with the first one that came to mind. And uh, and this might seem like an insignificant one, but I swear to God, it's the it's it's really the the main band that I ever hear anybody ever say this about. I mean, it's a bit of an obscure band and I'm talking about Street Heart. So up here in Canada, this band constantly people say, oh, Street Heart. Oh, my God. That rhythm section was unbelievable. You see those lives. They were uh, those guys live. They were just cooking. Right. And, you know, in the early days, it was Matt Fernette who became Loverboy's drummer and uh, Spider Sinev, uh, his his name is. And then I thought it was funny because I'm looking at this. So on the first on the first album, he's called Ken Sinev. And then on the uh, on the second album. So so this is the this is the guy up here on the second album. He's called uh, Spider Sinev. And then on all three of the following albums, he's just called Spider. So, uh, so, so you know the bass player is special when when he just gets a gets a one name nickname in a band eventually, right? Um, so, and then Matt Frenette is not the drummer later on. But this band, um, when you listen to those classic first two albums, and they're not particularly heavy. I mean, they remind me. I was playing them again, and and they remind me a little bit of uh, almost like a cross between Triumph and City Boy. There's there's kind of a there's kind of a poppy, funky, you know, very tight lockdown, well produced. That's right. One one of the one of the first ones, I think. Uh, who is it? Is it Nick Lagone on it? Oh yeah, produced by Manny Charlton. The, oh the, wow, the second Nazareth. One. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. I think I think yeah, engineered by Nick Lagone. So he's part of it. Def executive producer Gary Muth, uh, recorded at Le Studio. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, so this is a this is a kind of a heavy album. It's it's like a it's like a heavy city boy album in a way. Um, 
I think Kenny Kenny is no longer with us, the uh, the lead singer. But yeah, there's Spider up there. Oh, there he is. Um, so yeah, when you listen to uh, these songs on here, and there's you know it gets a little it gets a little discoy at points, a little funky at points. But even on record, you hear like like wow, this there's there's something special about this band. You know, the vocalist is there, and the the singer, uh, you know, the the guitars are there. But yeah, boy, that rhythm section is just cooking, and and that's just like a like a classic legendary thing they say up in Canada about street art. Man, that rhythm section was amazing. So there you go. That's my first choice. Cool. I you know I you uh, held up one of those in some episode a while ago. Maybe the the yeah. Canadian rock episode we did. I think. Um, and I've always been intrigued to check them out, and I just haven't. But I think now I'm really going to have to do that. I like I like the album cover with the uh, with the girl on the front with the cigarette. That's that's kind of yeah. That actually <laughs> might have been. Let me just check here. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a hypnosis. It's yeah. it's actually a hypnosis. So this is a band from the prairies of Canada. I don't know what I, I can't remember what the U.S. release schedule was on these, whether they came out. But it's pretty interesting that it's produced by Manny Charlton. It's from the studio. It's got a hypnosis cover for a for a very you know quintessential baby Canadian band from the prairies. Um, but yeah. And there we are. Yeah, on the never, back. yeah there's, there's kind of a story of the uh, yeah, I remember I remember going over this in that that episode. Yeah. There's the guy showing up to the door and she's got pictures of the band all on on her door. Yeah. Right. Kind of, kind of thing but uh yeah and so so matt frenette there he is there he went on to great fame he's a great guy he was a really good in, in, interview i've met him a couple times so he he went on to great fame with lover boy and uh but spider stayed stayed with the band so and they still tour around but with very compromised lineup so he got me intrigued with a heavier city boy because i like city boy quite a, quite a lot so uh, yeah start with that second album under heaven over hell okay so i guess when uh when we decided to do this show, the, the bands or the, the rhythm sections that immediately came to mind for me, uh, you know, they've got to have the ability, right? Because that, that counts for a lot here. Uh, they have to be able to kind of keep all the mayhem of the bands that they're in the music together. You also have to hear them quite a bit in the mix on the albums, I think. And to me, I, I, I'm looking at all of my picks and, and in each of these bands, these two guys, uh, have big personalities too for the most part there it i think i went more for the bigger personalities the more well-known rhythm teams as opposed to yeah i know there's a bass player and a drummer in this band they're they sound really good but i don't even really know who they are and they don't you know on stage they don't really give much of anything they're just there so i went for kind of to me no-brainer picks that I think that uh, when people talk about rhythm sections, they kind of always come to mind that may be kind of, you know, expected, but I went with my gut, right? So my number one, or my, my first, the first one that came to mind was John Bonham and John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin. <clears throat> and, you know, there's one thing about some of these classic Zeppelin albums is that you you always hear both of them. Uh, Bonham's thunderous drumming is so important to the music of Led Zeppelin, whether they're doing blues rock, you know, proto metal, folky stuff, reggae, whatever. I mean, Bonham is at the center of everything. But I mean, to me, like John Paul Jones is one of the most underrated bass players of all time. And I think him and Bonham, you take either one of them out of this band and it's not quite the same anymore. And um John Paul Jones is a uh, bass playing very, very melodic, not showy at all. Like I've got busier guys, much busier guys on my list than him, but you know, the two of these guys together, you, you, as much as like Jimmy Page's guitar playing and Robert Plant's vocals are like the signature uh, thing that when you think about Led Zeppelin, this, the signature elements, you can't have Led Zeppelin without the other two guys. <clears throat> I don't think at all. So, you know, you can't put, uh, whoever you can't take uh, any other drummer and put them into Led Zeppelin and have it work the exact same way. And I don't think someone like a Chris Squire would work in Led Zeppelin. You have to have someone like John Paul Jones. So at times it's the simplicity of it is so great, but yet there's a bombastic nature of the two of them working together that I think, you know, really makes them the legends of, you know, rhythm that they are. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about uh, this band, I was looking through the CDs and, you know, which ones to bring out as examples here. 
you know, the early, the couple of early albums, the first two albums are more, you know, bluesy albums. And you, you hear like bon, uh, John Paul Jones, you hear him really high in the mix. But I think when you listen to some of these other albums that have lots of varied material on them, I think the subtlety of John Paul Jones matched with the, the, the bombast of bottom, I think works expertly together. And, uh, you know, these albums are just examples of where they, they cover every style together, always locked in the pocket. Um, you know, I mean, you, you listen to like Fool in the Rain from into the outdoor and that amazing drumming from Bonham on that and you know you got John Paul Jones it's just he's there again he's not showy he's holding the beat down he's keeping up with Bonham just expert expert stuff so I mean these guys for me were a no-brainer for my for this list so Led Zeppelin yeah they were on my honorable mention uh as well and and I was thinking you know where do I feel that and where do I not feel that and and what what started ruling it out for me first of all was was when I um when I thought it was more when, when the guitarist is doing what the bass player and drummer are doing all in lockstep in unison, I thought, I'm not really feeling the rhythm section. But then when I thought about all the blues stuff, like you correctly mentioned, you know, that's where you really hear them as a ry- rhythm section gelling. And the other kind of cool thing is that um, he's also part of the rhythm section sometimes as a keyboardist, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, uh, a, a piano anyways is considered a a percussion instrument because it's it's little hammers hitting the strings right yeah um so uh and, and sometimes uh he he does do certain he does regular he does all sorts of keyboardy things but he also does rhythmic keyboardy things too yeah so i mean listen to you know his electric piano work in no quarter i mean it's a perfect example of that yeah perfect example of that. yeah <clears throat> We never compared notes, so maybe I, I hope we don't have any uh, overlap ones. I'm a little worried about this one, but uh, we'll see. Uh, Steely Dan, no? Did, did you uh, did you pick some good? Okay, <laughs> so Steely Dan, um, I almost picked, almost in uh, in tribute to the whole idea of all the great fusion shows you guys have done, right? Um, because I I thought I don't know much about that stuff, but to me this is kind of the same sort of thing where. There are some amazing rhythm sections um, because of because of fusion and infusion. And Steely Dan is somewhat of a fusion band, I suppose. Um, but uh, but the but the funny thing is, you know, I, I just kind of made it made a few notes here. You know, drums on Asia, Ed Green, uh, Rick Murata, Bernard Purdy, Jim Keltner, Steve Gadd, bass, Chuck Rainey, Walter Becker. So Chuck Rainey does a lot of bass in Steely Dan. Uh, um Let's see. A royal scam, all except uh, one uh, on on the drums is Bernard Purdy, Purdy uh, bass, Walter Becker, and Chuck Rainey again. Katie Lai, Jeff Percaro, all drums except one song, bass, Walter Becker, Chuck Rainey, uh, and Wilton Felder. So, so essentially, um, you know, there there's no actual you know main lead guy except you could probably pick up Bernard Purdy and Chuck Rainey. But um, you know, it, this is another one when I thought of rhythm sections. You know, uh, hey night, not not hey. What's the first song on on uh, on Gaucho? That that song yeah. just came right into my mind. Babylon Sisters. Babylon Sisters is awesome. Yeah. yeah, so that came to mind immediately, right? Um, you know, in terms of uh, this idea of this this really cool, fluid, funky rhythm section, how important rhythm sections are. And again, to bring up a point I said earlier, um, you know. You, you hear, and, and as you said, with the blues situation, you hear these rhythm sections and can assess them more if there's not much going on elsewhere and if they're not playing the same thing as the rhythm section. So, you know, if there's if there's little, you know, clavinet or B3 or organ or, or little guitar licks and everything's kind of like spaced out, you can really hear these rhythm sections breathe and you can you can definitely hear that on, on Steely Dan. So that's my, that's, that's the closest I get to fusion. Uh, uh, in this list well i mean yeah it, it, it's fusion of a different kind right because steely dan fused like rock pop and jazz and r&b like all together into this really this style of music you really can't explain and there's no one else like them no one else like them and, and that's actually that's a good example because because they have used so many rhythm sections over the course of their career yet all of them are just completely amazing no matter who's doing it no matter what song because you know every song could have a different rhythm section but it's it it, there's a uh, consistency across that catalog that's that's hard to deny yeah yeah it's good good choice so my next choice um is kind of like, like the complete opposite of my first one in that uh 
I don't know if technically these two guys actually worked that well together because I always got the impression when especially watching seeing them well I never saw them live in this this lineup but uh, seeing plenty of live clips over the years I never thought that the I, th- I always thought that the drummer was more locked in with the guitar player and the bass player was kind of doing his own thing and there's kind of like this controlled mayhem with these two guys that I think really really worked but you don't hear it as much you do on the albums, but it's more like their live albums and, you know, any live concerts you've seen from them where you really have to be amazed at the skills of these two guys together personally. And I know Martin and I may disagree a little bit on this one. I don't think this band was ever the same after one of them passed away. And I'm talking about the who and specifically, obviously it's John and Twistle and Keith Moon. I mean, for me, when you listen to their live albums from, you know, back in the day, the early 70s here, Live at Leeds and Isle of Wight, and if you've seen any of the footage from Isle of Wight or Woodstock or any of these things, uh, it's really interesting how, like, really busy these two guys are, but it's almost like they're working on different planes from each other. And if you ever watch any of the old footage, Keith is watching Pete all the time, and those two guys feed off of each other, whereas you rarely see Entwistle and Keith kind of looking at each other and watching what the other is going to do next. So it's really this kind of like, it's just like unbridled chaos in the who, but it really, really works. Cause you have Keith is like so unorthodox. Entwistle is busier than most of these other bass players, save for one that I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and, you know, as opposed to like John Paul Jones that I just mentioned, who's just really locked in and kind of, you know, keeping everything grounded, you know, Entwistle is like, almost like a soloist in this band because Pete is not much of a soloist, soloist, especially back in the day. So here you have these two guys and, you know, Keith Moon's doing his thing, going berserk. Entwistle's going, Entwistle's, Entwistle, say that fast five times, uh, is going nuts. But yet you listen to the music and especially I think like on an album like Quadrophenia where, you know, I love the mix on this album because I think Entwistle is very high up in the mix. He's doing a lot of lead stuff on here. Uh, and you've got a very, very busy moon, but yet these songs are so co- compact and concise and they're not overly kind of like showy or anything like that. And uh, I don't know for me. And plus, like I said, at the top of the show, there's something about the personality aspect too. So here you have two distinct personalities. You know, Entwistle is the quieter guy in The Who, but yet he's the ox. He's definitely got, you know, he's got the look. He's, there's something about him. And then you got Keith Moon as the wild and crazy guy. And his drumming per- perfectly personifies that. So uh, I had to choose him for this episode here because uh, I think to me, they're one of the great rhythm sections of all time, even though maybe not that kind of locked in, kind of funky, groovy type thing, because it's not that at all. Uh, but based on the virtuosity here and the unpredictability uh i really wanted to include them here even though i I don't think it quite matches up with the other ones but yeah that's interesting so so when if you define the word section as uh two legendary guys on those two positions the who totally fits right but then if you think of section as how locked in are they you know you're you're right i mean it it you know you think of who the who music and it's never grooves it's it's basically thorny and bumpy it's a bumpy ride all all the way through right yes. so yeah they're they're never they're never this band like you, you know as as roger glover would say you know i play teenage eighth notes right you know and you know you hear <laughs> you hear great stuff like highway star where else does he do that smooth dancer i think that kind of thing where it's just like just really getting in a great groove where he just says no i'm just i'm just locking in sort of thing and yeah you you don't get that with end whistle so no yes and they yeah because that's why i said it's almost like they're not working together at all they're just up there together but i i was always amazed watching those early who clips and and just seeing like moon never looks at end whistle ever him and him and pete are constantly locked in together feeding off each other and that's just really weird because you don't see that a lot but that's why that's what made the Who such a really a wildly unpredictable and different band. I think that's part yeah. of their part of the appeal for me, anyway. Yeah. Cool. All right. <clears throat> okay. My next choice is uh, Porcupine Tree. Oh, so wow. here you go. Here's some Porcupine Tree for you. 
the, the, the classic era, right? This is the first one that got everybody kind of excited by the band, not their first album, but this was the first big album uh, that, that, you know, they were the it band for a while there with uh, In Absentia, right? Um, Deadwing, I didn't think the production was as good on Deadwing. That was a little, little bit of a setback. But then Fear, Fear of a Blank Planet is, is um, absolutely one of my favorite albums of all time. And we're talking about Colin Edwin on bass and Gavin Harrison on drums. And, uh, and you listen to the new album. The new album is very, very rhythmic, right? Yeah. Um, it's really almost like a, like a showcase of, of rhythm. Um, and, and you do hear both of them, and they both do interesting things. So, yeah, I, I think this band has, <clears throat> has become a band where you, uh, you, know, you do look over there uh, to, to what they're doing. And, and Stephen Wilson has a little bit of the Alex Lifeson to him. So he's a, he's a little... Uh, you know, and Alex, of course, guessed it on on a song with them. I think just one, but um, so so uh, when that happens again, when when I started looking at my list, I thought, well, yeah, okay, it's it, you know, you get to hear them more and you get to assess them better if the guitarist is doing something totally different. Pete Towns, it's kind of the same way, right? Um, so uh, so yeah, I I think uh, they're a, a great rhythm section and uh, and it's a big thing you think about when you think of Porcupine Tree. And then I went and actually looked at because the first thing I thought of was was OSI. And then I was kind of looking. So so the the debut album is is Mike Portnoy and Sean Malone Stick, um, and uh, and Free is Mike Portnoy and Joey Vera, but bass only on five of 10 tracks blood is gavin harrison and jim mateos right so gavin is in the band fire fire make thunder is gavin harrison and jim mateos again so so that's kind of cool you you get him in there and and i i actually did think of osi first but then i i started kind of going through it and realizing there's kind of more of a lockstep thing going on with those guys than you get with porcupine tree porcupine tree can be a very funky band funky proggy band um so yeah i thought uh uh, legendary rhythm section there and and the real shame about the new album is that actually uh colin is not on that album which i think upset a lot of people uh because they didn't want to see that classic rhythm section broken up and yeah. uh, you do miss his playing a bit on the album although Stephen wilson you know does a good job on the bass on that album but yeah that's a good choice um that's like one of those bands that uh all the members are really, really important to the overall sound, even though Stephen Wilson kind of gets all the credit for, you know, the arranging and the guitar playing and the vocals. Uh, it just, everybody else in that band just, and Gavin is such a, such a great drummer. So that's a, that's a good choice. All right. So, uh, so now I am going to go to a rhythm section that's all about the groove and especially the early part of their catalog before they added a keyboard player. Uh, it was all about the bass and the drums and then the guitar and then they did a little bit of ham and organ at times on a few songs but it's grand funk railroad and it's uh, mel scatcher and don brewer and i you know it's like this is the band that to me from this era has like the the fattest bottom end and you know whether you like them or you don't uh, there's no denying on some of these early records that uh, just man that booming bass and drums and they're just they're completely locked in and you know there's a reason why this band is called Grand Funk Railroad uh, because there is a lot of funk in this in this music there's uh, it, you know it's early hard rock you know you, maybe some of you can call it early early proto metal they're all all of them were big fans of like rhythm and blues and soul music and it's just this raucous garagey and Mel's bass is big and fat and just Don's thunderous drumming. But those two guys, you know, you had, you had Mark Farner out the front of the stage who did most of the vocals early on. Uh, and, you know, he's got this wild style of kind of crazy guitar, you know, not really virtuoso, but he's just got this interesting kind of I'm the guy out front. And then these other two guys off to the side, but man, just powering along song after song after song and uh, sometimes you know i with early grand funk music I, again i love mark's guitar playing but sometimes i just sit and i listen to those these two guys cooking in the background and you can really hear it on the live album it's like man that's what a rhythm section that's locked in should sound like and uh you know again say what you want about grand funk i know some people love them some people don't i know the critics hated them but i think that uh, the signature part of their sound as much as mark is you know the front guy 
uh, are these two guys on the drums and on the bass. I think just so important to their sound. And uh, I mean, you know, you listen to like foot stomping music. I mean, Jesus. And there's no guitar in that, right? Except for the guitar solo. That's like Mark on Hammond organ. And these two guys just absolutely killing it. And it's just a great example of all they do so well together. But yeah, this is this was another no brainer pick for me. Uh, Grand Funk Railroad, Mel Scatcher and Don Brewer. Yeah, and and a little bit of the whole, uh, you know, rubbing off of of the the Motown ethic on those guys right, as well, right? right. So yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. All right, uh, my next choice here, um, King Crimson. Uh, but this this era of King Crimson, which I'll I'll explain in a sec. Um, and yeah, Gavin Harrison. How much has Garrett Gavin Harrison been been part of that whole situation? He's 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 been part of the modern situation. Yeah. On, on yeah. and off or just constantly? I can't remember. He's been consistently in the band for like the last, I don't know, eight years, maybe a little bit more. I'm not really sure. So everything they've done post uh, Baloo, like, you know, since uh, since they kind of came back and started doing like, uh, you know, the, the greatest hits of King Crimson. So he hasn't recorded anything with them, uh, yeah. but just the, all these tours that they've been doing for the last, again, I, I forget how long it's been, five, six, seven, eight years, something like that. So it's been, it's been a while. Yeah. I've, I've seen them live yeah. with him and um, Pat Mastelotto, I think. Right. Yeah. Would yeah. He's been, been, yeah the, so... the, the three, the three drummer thing he's been. Yeah, apart. that's right. So, so there, there's a rhythm section for you. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm still, I'm still like calculating in my mind how, how I didn't know or forgot that Gavin is not on the latest porcupine tree. I'm going, well, oh, geez, wow. I did. I, I forgot about that. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that record of course is still very rhythmic, but I mean, if we want to talk about the most absolutely, you know, massive, um, rhythm section of all time it, it is that three drummer situation with king crimson right but yeah um but for me uh th this was a, a clear choice uh tony levin and bill bruford um because rhythm is so much a part of um you know what this band does there's one of my digi digi pack versions of that there's a there's a regular with the with the blue it's kind of cool had, had the blue and then you know so we've got red red blue and yellow um that era, very tight era. And uh, of course, um, you know, what's amazing about that whole situation is both, both guys have their own sound, but it locks in so beautifully. It's kind of a, it's kind of a world They're They're sort of a world music band in a way, right? There, there's a real sort of um, African drumming vibe uh, to what Bill does. And then, uh, and then uh, Tony, of course, we've got fretless, you know, stick, sort of thing going on and that's that's another clue that i've noticed across some of this stuff when you when you hear fretless i mean it it perks your mind uh to to oh yeah treat this rhythm section as special right yep. yep in a way but uh but again uh you get a situation here where both guitarists are very distinct and they're off doing something totally different and and king crimson they actually can groove on on a lot of these songs but they also have a lockstep thing that they do too um you know so you so you've got you've got looping and stuff that can go on around it as well um so they do everything but um you know, you definitely notice there's four super, super distinct guys in this band. Um, the two guitarists are completely different from each other as well. And uh, and they're they're not they're not really locking in with what these super distinct drummer and bass player are doing as well. And then I thought, OK, so so does is Tony Levin, uh, you know, part of a great rhythm section with the Peter Gabriel group. And I thought, no, not really. Um, in, in that situation, it, it seems a little bit more, it, it is more lockstep and more simple rhythmic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool and it's really interesting, but I don't, I don't think of that as a rhythm section very much. There's not, there's not a lot of grooving along with hi-hat and everything and toms and cymbals and stuff. There's, there's just, you know, True. and then, so it's, um, so it's a different kind of section there, but I, I think it is an amazing, uh, super entertaining and interesting rhythm section with two legends in the uh, in the red, blue and yellow period. King Crimson. Very happy you picked that that rhythm section, because uh, I am now going to pull from out of my honorable mentions into my main list. The other great rhythm section from King Crimson. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> One constant here. We got Bill Bruford along with John Wetton from the uh, Larks, Tons, and Aspect, uh, Starless Bible, Black, and Red era. Uh, I, I felt very strongly about both picks and i ultimately went with with this one just because i think these albums mean a little bit more to me but it, it, there's uh there's some similarities here and some differences because i think that with bruford and wetton here you have i think 
Bruford is a little more jazzy on these albums, whereas Wetton is the anti-jazz player. I mean, he's he's a he's a rock bass player and he uses lots of like, you know, fuzz and volume on these recordings that I think makes for an interesting combination because you know, when you, you hear it, you're like, okay, you know, Bruford's very busy. Wetton's kind of busy, but he's more like loud and beefy and in your face, but yet you can't have these albums without these two guys doing this. It's, it's a little bit different because I think that Bruford and Levin were definitely more locked in throughout those albums that you just spoke about. Whereas this is kind of a little, little similar to the Who situation where this is kind of almost like pure chaos, but it works really, really well. And I don't think anybody really gave Wetton's bass playing uh, its due until these albums because, you know, Wetton, very, very fine bass player. And uh, I always wanted to hear him working more with Bruford going forward. And I know they did briefly in, uh, in UK, but uh, I just, I love the sound of these guys on these albums because again, it really stands out. And this is standing out in a band where you have all this Mellotron and Fripp's ragged, jagged guitar work, but yet you hear these two guys on every song always uh and they work really really well together when you watch you know there's not a lot of clips of king crimson from this time period but when you do i mean they are just firing it up on all cylinders together up on the stage so yeah it's i, I think you can't go wrong with either pick here for king crimson and uh kudos to fripp for having such great rhythm sections all throughout and then you know you can go backwards in time and go look at the the early lineup and whatnot but i think uh for my money, it's these two lineups, these two rhythm sections we just talked about that are absolutely legendary. Cool. All right. So, so my last choice, uh, this is another one that's a little bit like the street heart one. It's like a, like a fine finery a finesse sort of, uh, you know, one, you know, non-obvious choice, but the Kim Mitchell EP and the, the first full length album, Akimbo, a logo and shaken like a human being. Um, they're, they're standard hard rock poppy songs. There's some keyboards, there's choruses, there's whatever there's, they're not proggy, although the EP can be quite monstrous and proggy, but we're talking Robert Sinclair Wilson on bass, who no one really knows. And Paul DeLong on drums, who's a little known up here in Canada. Um, you know, really legendary for, for this, but, um, so, and I'll, I'll mention Max Webster in a second, but, um, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, on that EP, and you know, I've raved about that EP all over the place. Oh, great. Yeah. Five, five amazing, amazing songs, but the rhythm section on it is monstrous. It's beautifully recorded. It's a traditional rhythm section. So it's a little more like, you know, are these guys locking into a groove and stuff, but there is some crazy playing. And Paul DeLong is just, just a crazy man on it. He's so, so groovy and rhythmic at the same time and, and smart and doing cool things things um but um so so then after that you know less so it, it feels i mean it it kind of goes less 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 across those even three things but that ep is absolutely five tracks of magic but my first choice was going to be um when dave miles joined max webster and you've got mutiny up my sleeve and uh you've got well okay so the live album you, you oh, yeah. hear the grooviness you yeah. know people have always said about dave miles there he is there yeah. um I think he's from detroit i think he's from michigan um but um you you've always heard about this band wow what a bass player dave miles is you know when you replaced mike and mike tilka did a great job as well I've, i have no problem with mike tilka but um you know even mike says yeah dave was just on a whole another level for me but you've got you've got uh Dave Miles in there with Gary McCracken, who's who's, you know, a legendary, amazing drummer. You know, the big drum set. He's kind of like Max. Max is the baby rush and Gary McCracken is the baby Neil Peart. Right. Um, but there's there's Dave Miles there. You know, he's, he's even got the classic bass player look. Right. The, <laughs> the, the Rick McLeish, Philadelphia Flyers handlebar mustache yep. kind of thing. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, he, he's uh, 
the bass playing across these Max Webster albums, you, you always think of the the little the little disco lick in Paradise Skies as like one of the magic moments of all of Max Webster's sound, right? But there are so many places all over these places, uh, all over those records where those two guys just lock into a groove. And then fortunately, like I say, you've got the live Magnetic Air live album where you could really hear it happen in a live sense. So, uh, so that's that's kind of a two for two for, but um. If I was to, you know, if I was to pick something for folks with short attention spans, just go straight to that EP and just play those five songs start to finish. One year, a monster of a rhythm section. Yeah, that's such a great EP. And, and his first full length is amazing, too. It's yeah. yeah. What a talent Mr. Mitchell is. Um, all right. For my final pick today, uh, another kind of no brainer for me and the drummer here. And of all, like, I guess, heavy metal drummers that I've ever listened to, the, he's the guy who has the most swing to his music. And I think that's what makes his playing in this band so unique. And the bass player, while he may be kind of following along with the, the guitar riffs uh, on a lot, there's something about these two guys together that I think is absolutely legendary and makes the music of Black Sabbath go round and round and round. Bill Ward and Geezer Butler on these, or, you know, I'm sitting there thinking of some of these songs, man, like, you know, Electric Funeral, Hand of Doom, and I'm like, uh, you know, NIB, and Children of the Grave, and yeah. Sweet Leaf, and just like, man, what a massive rhythm section here on these early albums, and yes, I'm going to not show Never Say Die, because that's just the way I roll, right, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what, what much more I can say about these guys, you know, uh, Bill Ward could be thunderous, just like a John Bonham or an Ian Pace, uh, but kind of like Pacey, I think that uh, there are little intricacies that Bill Ward always does in the Black Sabbath music. And again, he's got this great sense of groove and swing because I think he's he had a, a real big jazz background back when he was younger. And I think it really works in this band. And, uh, you know, he's. To me, you can't have Geezer Butler not there in this equation. And I think the, that's that's what makes the the early albums. You know, again, it's always all going to be about Iommi's riffs and Ozzy's vocals. But you, you take away the other two guys in, in this band and it's not the same. It's just not the same at all. So uh, I had to bring them up in this conversation. Cool. <clears throat> nice. Nice. Yeah. Honorable mentions. Um, I mean, I've got uh, Little Feet, Kenny Gradney and Richie Hayward on drums. Good choice. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> Meshuggah has been mentioned, you know, but but I think that's as much as uh, uh, about guitar being in lockstep with those guys and overshadows yeah. you thinking about the bass. <laughs> I thought of that as well. And I absolutely agree with you because I, I think it's more about that that eight string guitar and the, the you know, the, the low, low end of the guitar playing as opposed yeah. to bass. But yeah, I mean, Tomas is just, yeah. Yeah. And then I thought of Van Halen and then I thought, ah, it's kind of more about the drums. And then also like, then I thought, okay, do I got to go figure out wh which songs Eddie plays bass on versus, versus Mikey. And I thought, I don't know, man, it's, it's not really about the rhythm section in most cases. Right. Um, just edged out for me was black country communion, Glenn Hughes and Jason Bonham. Right. Um, you know, and I played a bunch of that <laughs> stuff to sort of think about it. And I thought, ah, maybe not, you know, um, and then, you know, I, I thought about, you know, what, what's, what's another key one that's going to come to mind rush. Right. So yeah. with rush, I, I started thinking and going, I don't think of those two guys as a team of a bass player and a, and a uh, drummer all that much. Right. Um, even though Alex is off in space doing other things and, and allowing you to hear what those guys are doing. But uh, I, I almost think of uh, Neil and Getty more of a team when it comes to the vocals, vocals and lyrics team more than. Uh, so, yeah. So there's a few that I kind of ruled out and I, thought, I was thinking ZZ Top. Ah, I don't know. Um, Iron Maiden, not particularly, you know, it's it's sometimes that rhythm section is not doing a very good job. Right? You know what? I almost picked Maiden for Steve Harris and um, uh, Clyde Burr. Yeah. Because, I mean, you listen to, like, the first two albums, they're pretty locked in on those albums, those two guys. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I don't – Nico and Steve, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, they got some great grooves now. You know, I, I was thinking, well, boy, I, I, I love, like, 
flight of Icarus, die with your boots on, you know, you, you can hear some really good grooves that they put together. But then I thought, no, we're, we're going to, we're going to slap Steve on the, on the hand with a, with a, with a ruler for just being too clacky sometimes and not being a very, very, you know, being kind of, kind of messy with that stuff. And then having the sounds cancel each other out. And then you're not, you're not really enjoying the bass sometimes. Right. Yeah. So uh, I don't know who, who'd you have? Well, I mean, I had Rush on my honorable mentions list um, only because, again, you know, you, we, we talk about this team thing here. And to me, it's almost like Rush kind of works so well together because you have these three amazing soloists and outstanding virtuosos that they work really well together. Um, but as a rhythm team, maybe not quite the same as some of these other ones that I picked, but I mean, man, yeah you can't not mention rush in this right because they're just so incredible at what they do and it's just such a part of their overall sound i mean you know getty is my favorite bass player of all time neil if he isn't my you know he's probably not my i think cozy powell has always been my favorite drummer but neil is probably number two or three uh so it's almost like you have to mention just by default even though they kind of go against the grain of some of the other things we've been talking about but they got to be mentioned Uh, i also had motorhead on my list Hmm. Lemmy and Filthy, right? I mean, that's huge bottom end there, right? The ragged guitar riffs flying over the top. Uh, I mean, Deep Purple, you know, yeah. Ian and Roger. Ian and, and uh, Glenn, I thought, made a pretty good team there for a bit. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably others, but uh, that's all I got. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I also thought about Faith No More, including them. I, I actually looked up a couple lists and what people tended to lean towards for rock rhythm sections, you know, like listen to this list and tell me what they have in, in common. Primus, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Rage Against the Machine, Tool, Deftones, The Police, The Funk Brothers. So so there's there's a real like everybody's thinking the funk thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the funky thing when they think rhythm sections. But, you know, that's not necessarily what we should think about. And then, you know, I was thinking Pantera. Pantera is such a cool rhythmic band and you get so yeah. into it. But it's not about racks. It's it's about you know, Rex and Dime together making that monstrous sound next to Vinny's exacting thing. And it's, you know, they, they groove and they and they also have a really locked, you know, locked in mathematical thing going at the same time and a very rhythmic band. But uh, again, you don't really think of Rex and, um, you know, and and that got me thinking about when um, I think it was for Death Magnetic that I that I interviewed uh, Robert Trujillo for. And he, he uh, you know, after we were finished uh, the interview, you know, he expressed some concern. He goes, uh, he goes, you know, when you made that comment about the bass on it, you know, what did you mean by that exactly? Because because he he knows and, and he he you could tell he was a little upset with how his bass sounds on it. So you get you get situations. So Rex is kind of like this. And it made me think of this. You get situations where um you get a bass sound, a bass tone, but you don't get articulation on the bass. And Robert was was like, I think he was a little disappointed that there's this bass sound throughout that record, but you don't really hear his bass playing, right? Yeah. So, so you're never going to feel that. So so in this whole rhythm section discussion, you know, I, I see we we kind of tend to lean towards the guys where uh, where you can really hear the articulation and the bite and what they're doing, right? Yeah, yeah. That To me, that's important. Um you know, I mean, I another one I was considering was the Stones. Yeah, because that's you know those two guys. Uh, a lot of like old school rock fans will will probably lean towards picking uh, those two, and uh, I I you know couldn't really argue that too much at all. Again, they're just kind of both in the pocket. They're neither one is very busy, uh, but they're doing what they need to do there. But yeah, do you when you listen to the Stones, are you necessarily hearing them as much as you hear some of these other ones? I don't know. Cool. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, our favorite rhythm sections down in the comments. Uh, please put in yours and let us know why you think uh, the way you do. So, uh, Martin, uh, updates on your end. What's going on? Uh, Contrarians podcast books. Uh, Contrarians. I just put up a, a couple of real quick things. One on the brown sound of Van Halen and one on uh, my response to a panel that we had up um, the podcast. uh I'm going to experiment with putting up sharing on Facebook, some of the old episodes and see, you know, if I can see, see the little line go up, you know, cause there's this cool analytics thing we can look at, which is kind of neat. Um, 
And then the books all have in easy action, the Alice Cooper one, which sold out um, pretty, pretty soon again. So yeah, easy action feed, feed my Frankenstein and the damned one of the three new ones, martinpopoff.com. Cool. Sounds good. Uh, stay tuned here. What do we got coming up tomorrow on the UK connection? We've got uh, ranking the songs on classic albums. So we're going to be ranking the songs on uh, the captain and me from the Doobie brothers. So that's coming up tomorrow. And then on Sunday, we've got ranking the album show. Uh, Jamie Laszlo and myself are ranking the albums of witchcraft, which reminds me, Jamie asked me when we recorded that, he says, I wonder if Martin likes the Swedish band witchcraft. I'm like, I don't know, but I can ask him. So Martin, have you ever listened to witchcraft? Vaguely, yes. I've, I've listened to them, but I don't really remember what, uh, gotcha. what the story okay. is. Yeah. Yeah, you might want to check into that. I think you'd probably dig them. So really, really good band. So that's coming up on uh, Sunday. And then, of course, we kick off the work week with uh, Hudson Valley Squares on Monday. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell. And also, please give us a like before you leave. For Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. We'll see you next week here on The Fun House. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend.